Good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to join you today for the Cary Business School's Distinguished Speaker Series, which I know has been a dynamic forum for innovative business leaders to share wisdom and insights with the Johns Hopkins community. Uh, never have such insights been more necessary than now as our country continues to face the fallout of a pandemic that has cost a staggering 500,000 American lives, caused one of the worst economic recessions on record, and further entrenched systems of inequality that have inflicted undue suffering on communities of color. The odds are against so many in our society right now, so it is only fitting that today's speaker is someone who, to quote the title of his autobiography, has been beating the odds his whole life, Eddie Brown. From driving a citrus truck by day and studying by kerosene lamp at night in a pupka, Florida to attending Howard University in Washington, DC, thanks to the unexpected support of an anonymous benefactor who simply wanted to see someone like Eddie succeed to founding Brown Capital Management, one of the first black owned investment firms in the world in 1983, which now manages a staggering $19 billion in assets. Eddie has shown the world that defying the odds requires equal parts preparation, intelligence, and persistence in order for that stroke of luck to find fertile ground. And at every step of the way, Eddie has not only worked to build his business and ensure that his family and his colleagues, who may as well be family, uh, find success, but also to ensure that future generations, especially young Baltimoreans, are like he was given the opportunity to realize their fullest potential. As he has said, we have to reach back, take someone by the hand, and show them the way. Along with his wife, Sylvia, he has continually invested in the people of Baltimore, giving to the arts, to education, to public health endeavors, and to entrepreneurship opportunities that have changed the trajectories of so many lives. At Hopkins, we're fortunate and proud to count Eddie as a friend, collaborator, advisor, and along with Sylvia, honorary degree recipients from our institution. He embodies our shared dedication to our city, and we have relied upon his wise counsel and support in so many parts of our enterprise, including, I am delighted to say, managing $75 million of the Johns Hopkins Endowment. Eddie, it is truly a pleasure to welcome you back to Hopkins tonight. Thank you so much for all that you do for us, but thank you for being here this evening in particular and participating in this uh, session. With that, I'll turn things over to Alex Triantis, Dean of the Cary School of Business. Since arriving here in 2019, Alex has brought to our institution his gift for pragmatic and principled consensus building that has deepened Cary's relationship with the entire university and has allowed the school to weather impressively the vicissitudes of the pandemic while still delivering a world-class business education. He's a great colleague. We're so delighted to have him at the helm of our institution's uh, business school. And uh, with that, just want to say uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, leading this discussion and hand the podium over to you. Thanks so much, Ron. Really appreciate the introductions. And um, good evening, everyone. Apologies for the uh, the late start with some technical issues, but it's it's great to have so many participants. and. Eddie, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's really, truly a delight to have you as our special guest. So I, um, as this uh, fireside chat will um, evolve here, I will be asking a few uh, questions to start us off. And um, to the audience mem members, I just want to let you know that we have the Q&A, the question and answer function in Zoom. And I hope that you all uh, post questions there and we'll try to get to as many as we can um, after I, I start with some initial questions to, uh, to Eddie. So Eddie, um, I want to say something. Sure, um, please. Introduction by Dr. Daniels is one of the best, most concise I've ever had. So thank you so much for joining us, first of all, and for that probably undeserved introduction. And thank you, Dean, for having me. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. And it is so well deserved. So, and a privilege to do it. Okay. Over to you, Alex. Thanks. So, as uh, President Daniels mentioned, um, your autobiography, Beating the Odds, which is a book I have very much enjoy uh, reading. And I feel like I've gotten to know you a lot better through reading that book. In that book, you share your journey from growing up in the rural uh, South to founding the successful firm that you lead today. 
And um, unfortunately, we don't have time to, to go back to some of the uh, colorful history that you describe in the book in, the, in your early years. But let's start in 1973. Uh, you started your investment career at T. Rowe Price Associates as the, first, as the firm's first black portfolio manager. And I was hoping you could tell us about those early days, maybe some highlights and the experience that you had there uh, that maybe also eventually led you to establish your own firm. Yes, well, thank you. You know, anytime this is mentioned publicly, I always give T. Rowe Price a lot of credit and thank yous. There was nothing in 1973 that quote, made them do it or even encouraged them to do it. So it taught me something, actually not the first black portfolio manager, the black, first black professional of any kind at T. Rowe Price in 1973. There was no pressure from the outside. They didn't have a Black Lives Matter movement. It was strictly, in my view, they were looking for talent. And fortunately for me, it didn't matter, you know, and it taught me that money is green. And if someone can produce or they think they can produce for their firm or their organization, they can look past that. So I give T. Rowe Price a lot of credit uh, for doing that at that time. Wonderful. Well, maybe you could take us through uh, a little bit the transition in your mind. I don't know when that happened, when you decided, I guess probably in the early 80s, leading up to 1983, to um, decide to, to start your own firm. And so what, what kind of inspired you to do that? Well, you know, it was something that's been in the genes from a very early age. You know, you mentioned my book and I talk about my Uncle Jake. Uncle Jake was a born entrepreneur and I kind of watched him in some ways followed in his footprints in a different way. And it was just kind of embedded in my mind that one day I would like to be independent, be my own boss. And I didn't know the word or anything about the word entrepreneurship, but as I look back, he was a born entrepreneur. And if it had been a different era, even though he didn't have the education, he just had the innate skills, I would say, to become CEO of a major Fortune 500 company. So that was the model, the inspiration. And so it was, in my mind, just a matter of time of putting all of the pieces in place. And there are several pieces that's very important. The one that I always mention at the end is if you're married, before you step out there to become, quote, an entrepreneur, make sure that your spouse is 100% committed because there are so many possibilities of bad times. And the last thing you want, you want support, you know, when you come home with tears in your eyes and things have not gone according to plan, you want support, you don't want criticism. So it's a partnership. And fortunately, my wife, Sylvia, bought into this crazy idea. Uh, you know, I said, let's give it five years. What's the worst case? The worst case is we've expended most of our resources <laughs> and it didn't work. I did it at an age where if it didn't work, I would still be young enough to quote, get a job. And I had a lot of confidence that that was the worst case and that I can always get a job. That was my view. So I saw it as a very small risk. So Sylvia um, took away one of the uh, big barriers that some people may face in starting their own company, but there are so many barriers and starting an investment firm like Brown Capital is, is, is very difficult. So what could you describe maybe some of the, the challenges or, or maybe um, early victories in terms of some of the, um, the pitches that you gave to CalPERS and others that, that really transformed things for you? Yeah, and before that, you know, you talk about businesses starting in their business plan. My business plan was on one sheet of paper, yellow sheet of paper, line paper. And the first bullet point was get clients. Because if you don't have any clients, you don't have any revenues. So unlike many, I'd studied a lot 
of businesses that had failed and especially African-American owned businesses. And I found a commonality and that is that they missed a basic principle, you know, that over whatever time frame they're giving themselves, you know, three years, five years, it shouldn't be one year or six months, that eventually income has to exceed expenses or otherwise <laughs> you're out of business. So I did a lot of pre-planning, targeting, decided I'm not going to get a fancy office downtown Baltimore. I'm going to get a PO box. We live in Glen Arm outside of uh, the Beltway. I'm gonna get a PO box in Towson. I'm going to have my office at my study at home. And if I need to meet with prospective clients, I'll meet with them downtown, you know, in a hotel or a restaurant. So what does that do? It keeps expenses low, if not zero, and you're prospecting. And I said, when I get enough potentials, then I will get an office. And then I will get not 10 employees, but one. So it was very methodical, and you might call it a, a bootstrapping approach. And I had a minimum such that I could attract, you know, it wasn't millions, it was a few hundred thousand. And my greatest surprise was my first day in business, which was right after the July 4th uh, weekend, 1973. I'm sorry, 1983, T. Rowe Price was 73, 1983. And I was a panelist on Wall Street Week for many years before that. And I got a letter first day that Monday morning that had come from a viewer of Wall Street Week. And she said, uh, Mr. Brown, I have come in to, and it was several hundred thousand dollars in a medical malpractice settlement and I've watched you over the years on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And I was wondering if you can suggest someone to manage my money. Bingo. First day in business. I said, yes, I can do that. So anyway, that was just a great omen of much greater things to come. And, you know, it's just uh, happenstance, luck. But, uh, you know, it went on from there. But I thought that was a great omen. First day. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up Wall Street because I would have brought that up if you didn't. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that probably a, a number of our participants here may not uh, be all too familiar, but certainly somebody of my generation is very familiar. Mm -hmm. And if one can believe that um, a bunch of people would sit around on a Friday evening and listen to folks talking about the stock market, but it was a very uh, popular show. Um, my, my wife's, um, I, I should tell you my wife, her family wanted her to meet somebody like Louis Rukeyser. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she didn't quite get somebody with that, um, big mane of hair, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. but it was a wonderful show and you were on the show for 25, uh, years and, um, yes. with an incredibly loyal following. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of that those years and, and what that meant uh, in terms of sort of how it helped to propel your firm. Yeah, well, a fellow T. Rowe Price employee, his name is Pete Calhoun, had been a panelist on the show for several years. And I think it was 1978, uh, they asked the panelists whether you know of anyone, said we'd like to have an African-American portfolio manager as a special guest. And Pete said, I know one. <laughs> In fact, I think at that time, I haven't checked this. I think I was the only African-American portfolio manager with a major investment firm in the United States. So it was just a great opportunity. And I was invited, you know, to become a panelist uh, eventually. But I was a special guest first. And a few weeks after that, they said, how would you like to join the panel as a rotating panelist? And that set off, um, you mentioned the audience, it was four to six million viewers nationwide on Friday nights, another two to four million on the rebroadcast. It had one of the largest, if not the largest audience on public television for all of those years that you mentioned. So it was just a great opportunity. It gave me, you might say credibility, gave basically national exposure. I remember one year, Sylvia, my wife and I, 
were in Europe, in Italy, in some small town village, sitting out having lunch. And this person walks by and they said, Eddie Brown. I said, wait, who are you? <laughs> and that happened multiple times outside the country. So it's just amazing at the power, the reach, the audience. So it gave me, you might say credibility. Uh, so when I was ready to follow my uncle's entrepreneurship, uh, I had 10 years at T. Rowe Price as a portfolio manager and it done very well. I had some capital. And um, so I said, what's the worst case? Worst case, I give it a try, it fails, and I'm gonna give it five years and see what happens. And fortunately, you know, it worked out very well, but I had a very well thought out plan, a lot of support at home and, and other places. And that program, I remember the one year, in fact, it's never, for the whole 30 plus years, the program was aired nationally. My performance, you pick a series of stocks, had to be stocks, at the end of the year, you can't change it. It's a frozen portfolio. And I think they give you a maximum number. Then at the end of the year, they open the bag and see, okay, how have they done? I had the best performance of any panelist over the whole, that one year is up 115%. Wow. And it just got nationwide you know, press. So I had a lot of um, things going for me. Um, you know, when I started, but I'll tell you what, uh, being black was not one. <laughs> well, and, and, and not only did you gain sort of that global recognition and, and, and appreciation for your performance, but I am, I'm sure that you inspired many who ended up going into the financial industry. So that, that, that part of it, you may not, never know sort of how many people you inspired. No. Uh, and then that one year when Rukas are basically selected me to be a member of that distinguished group of Hall of Famers. You know, Peter like, people like Peter Lynch and Milton Friedman, I mean, just luminaries. And he selected me that one year to be a member of the Wall Street Week Hall of Fame. I went through a whole litany, which just gave me, you know, just a huge halo. So I've had a lot of, um, not luck, but, situations that uh, worked in my favor. So let's talk a little bit then about uh, about stock picking. And um, I, I was hoping that you could describe sort of your special philosophy about uh, choosing investments uh, that you've honed throughout your career. Uh, I saw that a recent article, I guess a couple of years ago in, For in Forbes where they called it old school stock picking, that you're not out there just chasing fads. So maybe you could give a brief a sort of description of that philosophy. Okay, just a few significant things. First of all, we are growth style managers, which means we're investing in companies that have the potential to grow their top line or sales or their bottom line earnings much faster than the overall economy. We're very particular about how much we pay for those companies. We want, we only invest in what we call exceptional growth companies, not just any growth company that's well managed, a good business plan, and some uh, possibilities of great success. And we're not short term, we're long term, we're looking not at the next quarter or the next year, we're looking at the prospects for these companies over the next three, five years plus. So we're not market timing, you know, we're not trying to pick stock of the day, we're looking for exceptional companies well-managed with a long trajectory of potential growth. And, you know, we don't want to overpay. So we've done that consistently. The other thing that's made us so successful is the people. You know, I remember T. Rowe Price, the man, when I came in 73, even though he had retired, uh, he still had an office in the building. And I kind of checked on kind of what were the key things that caused T. Rowe Price to be successful. You know, founded in 1937, when I came in 73, T. Rowe had 6 billion total assets under management, 120 employees. And of course, look at them today, <laughs> 1 point something trillion and thousands of employees all over the world. But I took some basic principles I absorbed, you know, 
Peter Price, the man, basically said, look, this is not a capital intensive business. It's an intellectual intensive business. So you want to hire the best and the brightest, and not just those investment folks at every single level of the firm. You want to give them a great work environment, which is why we are in a historic mansion at Calvert and Biddle, built in 1877, I think. So it's, you know, it's like a mansion, it's a home. It's not like you know, a high rise downtown Baltimore. You want to treat them extremely well as human beings. Don't forget, you want to compensate them extremely well. In fact, so well that if it's about money, there are no other potential opportunities in the region, or maybe even in the country. And don't forget, the magic is in equity, ownership. So you give them the potential, not potential, you actually create a way for them to own a piece of the pie. So you're all in the boat together, rowing, I won't use the word, rowing fast <laughs> every day, excited because as the firm progresses and as it does well, we all do well, not just me or a few people, basically everyone. So I have um, set some goals that uh, you know we wanna create and we're well on our way, some very wealthy, nice community engaged with the, uh, not only the heart, but with the means of uh, philanthropy and giving back. Someone told me you don't give back, you're really giving forward. So we wanna create that kind of culture, that kind of group of very talented, excited people. So, you know, we have 36 employees, but they have been handpicked at every single level, one by one. And we'll come back to philanthropy in a second, because I know that's something very, very special to you and, and your wife, Sylvia. But before we leave um, the stock picking, I just want to talk a little bit about this past year. So you've been investing now for, you know, roughly uh, 50 years. <laughs> and uh, you've certainly seen a lot of bear markets and some crises um, over the decades. I'm curious, you know, what lessons have you learned from past bear markets and crises that helped this past year? And you know, were there any new lessons uh, this year or did you simply just stick to your knitting as you described a very disciplined process and just sort of sailed through this, uh, through the tempest of the last year? Yeah, you know, I think the thing is, is the longer term perspective, not trying to figure out whether the market's gonna go up, down, sideways for the next few months, even the next year or so. But the worst, the most scary period in my whole career was uh, 2008, the market crash, right? The worst market downturn since the 73, 74 market decline. I think the market was down about 37%. Our assets under management went from 6 billion down to 1.2 billion. We started getting calls, especially from the gatekeepers for these major pension funds and major institutions, including endowment funds. Uh, Dr. Daniels left, but including, you know, endowment funds. And they started to ask questions, you know, gee whiz. And I said, now is this in my mind just aimed at minority owned firms? Or are they asking these questions of all firms? And the question was this, how much longer, no, at what level of assets under management will you have to go out of business? I said, what are you talking about? So um, I came up with an answer. And they, um, you know, we, we went ahead, but that was the scariest time. And we were able to make it through. We didn't let us, Wall Street was laying off people left and right. We didn't let a single person go between the end of 2007 before the crash and the end of 2009, all of our employees except three had the same compensation that they did at the end of 2007. And how do we do that? The three most highly compensated, which included me, said we're gonna work for nothing, or basically nothing, to keep every single person on board and whole. So it's those kinds of, you might say, caring about the people, caring about their families, 
that's basically hopefully create a culture that we really care about every single person and your well-being and your family's well-being. You know, it's not just about trying to enrich, you know, a few people. We're all in this together. So well, that's that's a fabulous example of human-centered leadership, which um, is becoming more and more uh, the norm. But I think you were you were well ahead of your time on, on that one. Um, yeah. So looking through this crisis, again, we've stayed the course. We haven't, um, you know, panicked, uh, bailed out, and of course, you know, things are improving. But even during the worst times, you know, we um, said we know what we're doing. We know that there is some sunlight somewhere out there and we're going to stick with what we have done so well uh, for 36 years, 37 years now. So it's the long-term perspective is to stick to it. And it's, it's basically know what we're doing and that we do very well and you know, stay the course. Right, right. <laughs> well, good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change gears a little bit here because I, I wanna talk about another, um, another topic which I know you're passionate about and you've had such a big impact on which is the importance of making room for minority success. And last summer, I hope many of our audience members um, uh, saw this, this insightful piece that you wrote for the Washington Post, this editorial, on the persistent lack of diversity on Wall Street. And in your article, you wrote, America does not breed talent, it prefers to breed generational elitism, where very few minorities get to compete on a level playing field. So, from your 50 year perspective now in business, what has changed for minorities in business and uh, what hasn't in the sense of what challenges still remain? Yeah, well, it's taken a long time, but in the very recent past, things are bubbling up that creates a lot of hope. Many major institutions, whether they're pension funds and endowment funds, I guess, led by the boards of those, of many, not all of those institutions, they are sensing that it's been kind of a closed loop system and keeping a lot of worthy people out from participating. And in our case, say managing money. So the question that we started to ask ourselves when Barron's wrote this piece back last summer and they identified our small company domestic fund, mutual fund, as being in the top 1%, which meant 99% of others, they call it small cap funds, had underperformed for one year, three years, five years, 10 years, and 15 years. So we said, gee, we knew about everything except the 15. Why do we only have, at that time, I think it was 13 billion under management. You know, we should have 100 billion. And I said, I can only think of one reason, you know, the system. And the not open door looking for exceptional talent, like we look for exceptional companies, you know, so, but that is changing. We've seen many institutions think about it, think about diversity, uh, not only in the employment uh, of their employment, but also in terms of uh, a little bit cracking the door on the management of their assets and making a concerted effort. Um, you know, I think having people at the table in the boardroom and many companies, major domestic companies are seeking people of color, minorities in general and women, you know, to have a seat at the table. If you remember that Washington Post article, they had this, uh, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, we didn't have anything to do with it, but this drawing and they had the group huddled, three or four people huddled at the end of one table. You had the black guy all the way at the end of the boardroom table. And he's raising his hand and saying, hey, I wanna, and they are just kind of completely ignoring him, you know? So that's a picture of kind of a closed system, not open to diversity, opportunity, and giving talent uh, a chance. So, but it's changing, fortunately, I think, I think. Good. I, we're, we're all very hopeful, but we know there's uh, so much more to do. Right. Um, so turning to philanthropy uh, for a second, again, because I, I know how important this is to you and your wife, uh, Sylvia, 
that the two of you um, established the Brown Community Health Scholarship Program at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, which I think President Daniels <laughs> mentioned. And this uh, program trains future public health leaders who are committed to eliminating health disparities in Baltimore and other cities. And I know you've also funded other educational initiatives in, in, um, in Baltimore. So I'm curious, what role do you see for universities like Hopkins and perhaps also specifically for business schools like Cary in driving and supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts? Yeah, well, institutions like yourselves and uh, others have, I think, a great opportunity to offer, I think, scholarships because many times it's the financial barrier that prevent uh, diverse talent, you know, especially African Americans and people of color having access to many of the institutions. So you can play a great role in diversity and helping to build talent for the future generation by being able to offer a means for many people of color to be able to afford the opportunity you know, to come to the institution. That's why we've spent a lot of time and our money uh, kind of on education and offering um, opportunities. You know, something happened a few weeks ago, our communications uh, person got a request I got my MBA at uh, the Kelly School of Business at Indiana. And they were proposing, and I guess it's all the movement about Black Lives Matter and people of color, that they wanted to create a banner of some of their distinguished alums. And they had this banner with my photo on it. And they were going to fly it along the boulevard where the Kelly School of Business is. So I haven't been there to see it, but I said, we approved it. I said, heck yeah, I'd like that. So uh, it's amazing at the breadth and interest in the topic. So schools like the Cary School of Business, you know, can play a great role in adding more people of color and women uh, to the roles and offering the opportunity, you know, financial opportunity for them to, you know, to come. Absolutely. No. And it's something we're very committed to and uh, appreciate you talking about that openly. You know, every time I think about this, I think about my case. You know, I didn't have any money to go to college. And you refer to this lady, happened to be a white lady that unfortunately I never met, didn't have sense enough when I got some sense, you know, to find her. When I tried to find her, you know, I couldn't. But she sent $1,000 every year to the uh, registrar at Howard University. That $1,000 paid for my tuition, room, board, and books. Tuition was, I think, $106 per semester at Howard University in 1957 when I went there. So for my whole time at Howard, I had a full ride. Everything covered. All I had to do was work hard, study, and hopefully graduate, uh, which I did. But I always remember that. And that was a great inspiration. Boy, if I ever get a couple of dimes or nickels to rub together, I'm going to help. Or we, my wife and I, are going to help people, you know, of uh, modest means or no means. Yeah, so that's what we have been committed to. Well, thanks, Eddie. And um, I'm starting to look at, at some of the questions we have coming in, and there will be one interesting one related to that. So why don't I, I'm going to turn it over to, to some questions that we're getting from uh, the audience. The first one. Wait, uh, you didn't tell me that there's, there's an audience? I thought this was just a conversation with us. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> well, keep that in mind as you're answering these questions now. This one, by the way, the audience, I think, may have um, some, some friends of yours, because I reckon I'm not going to uh, publicly uh, mention the name, but I think this is one of your fellow um, senior executives in, in the Baltimore scene, and I think he's uh, setting you up to tell a good story here. So here it goes. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Eddie, the, um, your, your Uncle Jake. 
And so the question is, um, could you tell us some of the ways your um, Uncle Jake exhibited his entrepreneurial skills? And did he ever recruit you to participate or help? <laughs> Okay, this is a setup. I can imagine. I, I think, think I know who is. this is. I, I know the story, so I think it is. Yeah, this is a setup. So the story is, I mentioned my uncle Jake, but he had a credible, legitimate business for many years. He would, he had contracts. That area of Florida, Central Florida, was the major citrus growing region in the state of Florida at the time. So he would recruit workers from Southern Georgia, Southern Alabama, bring them into that region of Central Florida. And he had contracts with the major citrus groves in the area. And so in the harvest season, he basically provided the labor and he had the trucks you know, to haul the stuff to, uh, I guess it was a huge Minute Maid plant at the time and so forth. So that's what he, that was his role in his job. But then he found a much more lucrative field to branch into and so he switched gears and i think what the question is about he became one of the largest moonshine distributors in the state of florida of course it was illegal moonshine and i was spending a lot of time with my uncle and he had a lot of fast cars uh, 12 in fact that ran like 140 miles per hour and he would take them out out of sight and just have one or two at a time so the police would never know, you know, which car he's driving or who he is and so forth. So, yeah, in my young, in my youth, um, I was spending a lot of time with my uncle learning a different business with great profits. And uh, that was, uh, could have been detrimental. So I said, okay, if you look at your life, if anyone, they can probably identify a fork where if they'd gone down that path, instead of this path, things would be dramatically different. So I give my cousin, who's long deceased now, credit for basically saving me because she called my mother, who had left home when she was 15, I think I mentioned that, had me at 13. And she said, I'm concerned about your son. He's spending too much time with his uncle in this uh, little business that he has. Come and get him. And unannounced, my mother, who was then 27, uh, came and said, you were going back to Pennsylvania with me. And I didn't have a choice. Uh, she took me. So that was something that basically, I said, saved my, I wouldn't be where I am today if she had not made that call. In fact, he eventually went to prison. So <laughs> things turned around, as I recall. So yep. um, so related, we'll, we'll, we'll get, there's a couple of questions, sort of industry related questions, but just one more sort of personal question here. Uh, it says the following, you, you mentioned that the skills and talent for success has been in your family. We talked a little bit about that, but what advice do you have for young professionals who are first generation graduate students um, uh, rather than undergrad and trying to take their family to the next level and start building generational wealth? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that everyone is not cut out to be an entrepreneur. So the easy answer is become an entrepreneur, become independent. And if you're successful, you can build, you know, significant wealth. But everyone is not cut out to be an entrepreneur. So I would say kind of focus on whatever field you're in, you know, it's not going to be a moonshot, but work very hard and try to move up in the ranks of the organization and invest, invest. I think it was Albert Einstein, uh, I don't think this is true, but purportedly said, it wasn't the theory of relativity or any of the great scientific things that he worked on, it was really, the power of compound returns. You know, if you can generate, say, 7% per year, you know, there are tables showing money doubles, 10% per year. So to the young person, always write yourself a check, just like you're paying your utility bill 
of paying some bill, but into an investment account on a consistent basis. And you will be amazed if you invest wisely, uh, <laughs> how much wealth over many years you can actually create just through a consistent investment plan and approach every single month. And it's amazing the amount of money and eventually wealth you can actually create, but you have to be disciplined and consistent. A lot of people, you know, might do it for a few months and then, you know, get off the wagon. But I said, that's a very, very important way. But the desired way is, of course, become an entrepreneur. But as I said, everyone is not cut out to become an entrepreneur, take the risk and be successful at it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I've always wondered about that Albert Einstein quote. I used to use it in, in my finance. Was it right? Well, ah. <laughs> I think it was Ben Franklin who said, the money that money makes, makes more money or something right. like that as well. That's right. right. <laughs> so um, a question about, um, about the industry and, and, and transformation in the industry. So um, the, the participant asks, um, you, for your observation about the future of the asset management industry, uh, such as growth in registered investment advisors, consolidation in the market, and for example, if you want to get local here, the recent leg like Mason Franklin merger. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, hmm. That's a good question. I um, I want to express an opinion on the recent uh, merger, but generally, we Brown Capital we've had great success working with registered investment advisors across the United States because they are the source of giving advice and having assets on behalf of a large body of people, sometimes small institutions, and they're seeking managers to manage those assets. So the, um, I don't know if the person is a registered investment advisor or you know what the person is doing but that area for someone interested in the investment world if they have marketing skills and the ability to get a pool of clients that they can represent and find good investment managers on behalf of those clients you know that's one route uh, to pursue. That's a very, uh, can be very, and is very rewarding for those who are good at it. Yeah. You know, I think we're on like maybe 125 or 40 some platforms around the country. And, uh, you know, money just shows up uh, almost every day. Good. Another question here, um, sort of a governance related uh, question. So, mm -hmm. I, I, it's a, a long question, so I won't read it fully, but it's basically related to the ratio of CEO to um, what it says here, typical worker compensation, uh, whatever the appropriate metric is, but it was approximately 60 to uh, one uh, back in about 30 years ago in the late eighties. And uh, most recently about 320 to one. So basically five X. So I just kind of, Curious, um, it says, please give your thoughts on current practices and executive compensation. And again, paraphrasing here, whether or not um, in implementing ESG metrics around uh, percentage of workers that receive um, you know, stock-based grants. Yeah, I, what you have to be careful of, you know, if you're a stockholder in a company, naturally you should read you know, the annual reports, you should read all of the quarterly reports and the filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But the way some of those seemingly mind boggling numbers come about is because a lot of a large percentage of well managed companies executive compensation is based on stock options. And there are great incentives if those executives produce on behalf of the shareholders in terms of sales and earnings 
And if they do, and they are very specific metrics, that's the way you get to some of those just mind boggling uh, numbers. So you have to be careful. It's the job of the compensation committee of the board of these publicly held companies to basically make sure that the compensation is reasonable. But the way you get those huge numbers is if the managers, the executives are successful on behalf of the shareholders of generating revenues and mainly generating earnings, you know, those metrics are such that you can just get mind boggling numbers. But of course, that's the capitalistic system. Um, but looking at the regular pay, uh, hopefully the compensation committees of the boards are diligent in making sure that, you know, they have various metrics to compare to for that industry, you know, that type company, kind of what's the norm just in terms of, you might say base salary, but there are a lot of incentives based on the performance of uh, the company and very specific metrics. So that's the way you get those outlandish numbers and if stockholders benefit then everyone wins. So uh, here's a question um, regarding um, investments that you've made in, in black, uh, black owned businesses. And there's a couple mentioned here. I don't know how public these are. So I'll let you kind of discuss uh, your own uh, funding of black owned businesses, but maybe just more generally, um, we, we know that this is an issue in terms of, of the growth of uh, minority owned firms is the access to capital. Any, any general thoughts or specific thoughts from, from your own experience um, investing? No, actually, uh, I don't have much personal experience of, say, investing, quote, in Black-owned businesses. Uh, you know, we invest in businesses. And maybe what the person is referring to, you know, many times there are some, you might say, private uh, investment opportunities. And uh, there's a small group of individuals, uh, happen to be African Americans, who are very interested in supporting uh, black owned businesses to grow. Uh, so on a group basis, we seek opportunities in private companies that happen to be uh, black owned and offer uh, you know, investment capital uh, to those businesses. Maybe that's what they're referring to, but I don't do this personally. Uh, it's usually with a group of like-minded African-American business people, not just men, business people who want to help and see and offer capital, um, which is a major problem for many of the uh, Black-owned businesses is access to capital. Yeah. So solely needed, solely needed. Yeah. Well, we may only have time for one more question. So I think that this one, I would love to hear your um, answer it relates to um, what business schools can do to uh, better support uh, black students and prepare them for the very particular challenges that they may face after graduation. And, and the, the specific question is, you know, what would you have wanted more of uh, it, it, when you were in business school, or is there anything while in school that uh, you, you would have done differently? Yeah, I think an opportunity between that first and second year, you know, I had to kind of find my own spot someplace of, I'm thinking about MBA, graduate business school, to get some real live work experience that have the potential to lead to a job offer, you know, after that experience. So I think more targeted placement between say graduate school, I'm talking about MBA, will help if the business schools can, through the placement offices or whatnot, help students get placed uh, in an area where they think they wanna get a job, you know, once they graduate. And also just using one of the most powerful things that you have as uh, especially in graduate school is alums and using that alumni network 
to help the students, you know, who will be coming out, uh, make some connectivity uh, between that alumni network. I remember when I was um, trying to get into the business, I found something very peculiar. And that is, it was kind of a closed system. You know, if I looked at the resumes, even at a T. Rowe Price at the time, MBAs, Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, you know, that was it. I said, gee whiz, I'm Indiana. How am I going to get into this place? You know, I don't have the, so it was almost like a club of people tend to hire people like themselves. I found, I thought, as I thought through this, why is that? So they're all white. They're all kind of, you know, at these small group of schools and that's where they look, you know? So fortunately it's changed uh, dramatically, but I think the alumni network can be very powerful for the students, you know, coming out to be able to tap into um, and have a mentor. That's kind of the best of all, all worlds. A caring mentor who's looking out for them and their future. Yeah. And we're very fortunate to have a um, fantastic alumni, many of whom are probably on this uh, call. And, and um, so we're, we're very, um, very appreciative of that. I, there's one more question. I said it was the last one, but this, <laughs> again, this may be one of your friends. Um, it says, please, please share your secrets to wellness and vitality with us. Well, my secret is being married to a great woman who good answer, good answer, Eddie. Was happened to have been in the undergrad years a physical education teacher or major, and then went on to get a master's in health education. So she has been doggedly committed since we've been married, which has been gee, how many? Fifty-eight years. Wow. Almost every weekday morning you know, exercising, walking, doing weight, all sorts of stuff. So it's been, a, at least for the past 58 years, uh, a continuous um, process with a lot of motivation and inspiration. So staying in shape is something that um, I've practiced, you know, since I got married. A little bit before, but mainly since I've been married. She said, if you want to stay married to me, you have to be stay in shape. So I have a great motivation. <laughs> that was a perfect shout out and a great way to, to end our, our time together. Uh, Eddie, thank you so, so much. Uh, what a pleasure to have you here um, this evening with us. Um, I want to thank all the participants and, and um, hope to see everybody again. But, but thank you so much, Eddie. This was great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.